Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a new episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I am like over the moon excited because I have somebody on who I've been wanting to have on for a long time. And I was actually kind of nervous to ask her if she would come on because I thought, um, I don't know. I wasn't sure if she was going to say yes. And my heart was going to be broken if she said no, but she said yes. So yay. I have Elizabeth Nolan Brown on. She is a journalist. She is the senior editor at Reason Magazine. And she is here to educate us all on the sex trafficking panic that is happening right now and maybe um, give us a better idea of what's really going on besides all of these crazy numbers that we are seeing on social media and um, a lot of misinformation going on out there. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on. Yes, thank you so much for having me on. I was very excited to be asked as well. So, so just before we get into everything, how did you, because you're a libertarian, you're a feminist libertarian. Can you explain to people what that means? Because I also have an international audience as well who doesn't really um, know that much about the different political parties and, and what a libertarian is. Yeah, libertarian, and I say I'm a small L libertarian, so it's more of like a philosophy than, you know, believing in a particular party, although there is a libertarian party. And I just recently started to get a little bit more involved with that, um, sort of out of disgust with both the Republicans and Democrats, but that's another story. Um, but yeah, I mean, libertarians sort of believe in uh, what was sort of classical liberalism, or like, you know, I think it's something still called liberalism in the United States, but where it's, you know, based on more sort of socially liberal values, or just, you know, um, you know, believing in civil liberties, believing in free speech, uh, not being socially conservative. I mean, libertarians were one of the earliest to fight for drug decriminalization and prostitution decriminalization and things like that. But they're also more, uh, well, in American terms, at least to the right on economic issues, uh, just in terms of not wanting government regulation in pretty much anything. So, and that includes your sort of financial matters or the economy or just individual sort of licensing issues and things like that. Okay. And so then how does that fit in with feminism? Because that word alone is something that, has, I feel like has so many different meanings these days. Like when you say you're a feminist, depending on who you're talking to, they have like this different, all these different ideas of what that means. So what does being a feminist mean to you? Yeah. So, I mean, both, yeah, both libertarianism and feminism are sort of fraught terms that have a lot of meanings. Um, I think, you know, I, I say it because especially within the libertarian world, people sort of have this idea in the U S that libertarians are all that are they, we are, um, Republicans who like to smoke pot is one of the things that we're all sort of, uh, you know, that we're actually secretly conservative and uh, maybe misogynistic even or things like that. So I think, you know, libertarianism as a philosophy, it actually is very feminist just on its own without any qualifiers. But because people don't think of it like that, I like to add the feminist label, which, you know, to me, um, being a libertarian feminist then just means sort of uh, fighting for equal rights under the law regardless of your sex or gender or sexuality. And now, unfortunately, because so much of feminism does sort of mean more than that, it means sort of pushing for um, criminalization of certain things or special rights or just various, you know, things that that aren't just about sort of, you know, an an equal rights under the law measure, then I think that, you know, we actually end up pushing back against that sort of thing a lot. We end up sort of pushing back against mainstream feminists saying, you know, well, this is a bad thing. And so the government should get involved and make a law that, you know, throws people in jail for doing it. And, and, you know, that there are other ways to solve those issues. Right. So this is a perfect time to also introduce an acronym that not everybody may know that we use frequently on this show and in the adult community, which is a SWERF, which is a sex work exclusionary feminist. And basically they're feminists who are all for the equal rights of women, but anything that comes to sex work, uh, the idea is that all sex work is misogynistic. All women's are all women are victims of sex work, et cetera, et cetera. I know, obviously, from the work that you do, um, that you don't believe that. So, maybe tell me a little bit about how you became a journalist that seems to be more focused on how the law and politics intersects with sex work and and what interested you in that? Yeah, um, I've had a very sort of a varied career path and um, I I didn't study journalism in school, I studied theater. Uh, I went to Ohio University. It's the same thing these days, really, isn't it? (laughs) I studied, uh, yeah, and I 
studied in, in Ohio University, which is uh, on the Ohio West Virginia border in Appalachia. Um, while I was going to school, I worked at a strip club in West Virginia um, for like my junior and senior year part time, and so that sort of I think gave me my foundation in sort of as, as an actual. Yeah. Sorry, as a dancer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to. I didn't. If you were at the front yeah, door, yeah. your waitress. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you then, have some experience in that area. Yeah, I don't write about it a lot just because that's sort of you know there are plenty of people that do that, and that's sort of not where I was coming at it from. But like, right. I mean, I, I'm not. It's not like a secret or anything. So um, right. Yeah. So that gave me a, yeah I think a good foundation where a lot of journalists don't have in, in that sort of thing, and I've done you know various other things over time. Yeah, I was going to say that definitely makes you kind of like part of the community and, and gives you that foundation, like you said, that shows that like you understand the the plight of the people that, you know, you, you write about. So um, I guess let's jump into like kind of the main topic of conversation, which is sex trafficking. Um, the kind of mounting uh, press around the sex trafficking issue has really seen a spike, I think, in the last year. I think just like generally a lot of things have seen a spike in the last year because of the the state of um, the world right now, really, with the pandemic and politics and everything like that. So we're seeing and hearing a lot more about it. And there seems to be this belief that there's this like absolutely enormous child sex trafficking issue that we need to overcome. And, you know, I just want to say, first of all, obviously sex trafficking exists. Sex trafficking is terrible. Sex trafficking children is fucking terrible. Nobody um, believes otherwise, but I think that there is, it's, it's been hyped up in a way that is far beyond where, what the problem actually is. So could you maybe explain that and, and, and why you think we got to this place and your thoughts on just how this all came about? Yeah, this actually, you know, all started, you know, more than, than two decades ago when, you know, the, the porn wars, the sort of anti-porn feminists of the eighties and nineties, the, you know, Andrea Dworkins and Catherine McKinnon gang, you know, they really sort of uh, teamed up with the religious right uh, on anti-porn things. And after that, I mean, after that was sort of dying down, both because they got some things with the internet passed, but mostly it was just like not going anywhere, they realized. Uh, they decided to sort of team up on prostitution. And there's actually sort of, you know, documented evidence of these groups, these uh, rad femme groups and these religious conservatives or social conservative groups coming together and saying like, how do we now start opposing prostitution? And polls back then showed, you know, Americans weren't really that opposed to it actually, if it involved consenting adults. And so they're, they deliberately sort of set out to reframe all prostitution as sex trafficking, or at least muddy the waters enough that people, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't know the difference. And it's remarkable to see these things from like 1999 and 2000 saying that, and now two decades later, just see that fully be the case. You know, you'll, you'll look at um, police reports, you'll look at media covering police reports, you'll look at activists talking about this issue. And I mean, so many of them don't even make any difference, like you said, between you know, the things we don't want, which are underage people doing it and people doing it under force and coercion and between adults choosing to do sex work of, of various sorts, you know. So there's just been so much conflation. And I think, you know, a lot of it has been deliberate um, as, a, as an activist tactic or because politicians then latch on to this issue and realize that if they just sort of invoke sex trafficking, that they can pass whatever laws that they want saying anything um, but I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of well-intentioned people, too, who, you know, hear about this and they hear these crazy statistics that are, you know, um, we'll talk about that, I think, in a second. But, you know, they hear these crazy things and they think, OK, I want to get involved in help. And it's just sort of really spiraled out of control now where, yeah, people think that there's this epidemic of sex trafficking and, you know, kids are being sold on Wayfair, the, the furniture website and things like that. And it's just, yeah, it's really taken on a crazy life of its own, this sort of moral panic proportions. Yeah, I mean, because as the as like we're kind of progressing socially, you know, and obviously there's a big movement in the adult industry about decriminalizing sex work and, and just a, a cohesion among all these different players in um, within the sex industry, because, 
you know, back, I don't know, 10 years ago, there was a huge difference in everyone's mind between a porn star and a prostitute. And there was a lot of like throwing stones, you know, and if you were a porn star, you were better than a prostitute. And a lot of porn stars wouldn't work with girls who escorted on the side. And there was a big stigma around it. And now there's been a lot of um, the community coming coming together. And I think social media has a lot to do with that and recognizing, hey, we're all sex workers. And by us, you know, pointing fingers at each other and saying, well, my kind of sex work is bad, but your kind of sex work, I mean, sorry, my kind of sex work is good. Your kind of sex work is bad. We're really um, just dividing ourselves. So let's come together and let's really present this unified front. So even the idea of prostitution, which, you know, used to always be and still is, let's be fair, this this idea of this, this dirty, forced um, industry, and you have more and more women that are coming out and willingly speaking about like, yes, I do escorting, I'm a companion, um, I work at the Bunny Ranch. I've had a few of those girls on my podcast, and they've spoken very intelligently about their very intentional choice to be in this line of work and how they really enjoy it. So it feels like that term, like, let's save the prostitutes isn't going to work anymore, but sex trafficking, that's a good word because that alone, the trafficking suggests that all of these people are being pushed into something that they don't want to do. And so that feels like something that like everybody can get behind, including the conservatives and liberals. And like you said, a lot of well-intentioned people. Yeah. And like you said, it also, it can, it can reach into anything too, because then they can say, well, sex trafficking doesn't just happen in prostitution. You know, people are trafficking in the porn industry. People are trafficking in strip clubs. People are trafficking into all these different forms of sex work. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it really sort of provides this, like, all-purpose excuse for, you know, police to sort of um, monitor and, and do things on, on all sorts of topics that are, like, in adult entertainment industry or related to sex. Yeah. And the first time I really saw that affect us as an industry when the 2257 laws came into place... 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, Sorry, so, know. so actually the 20, so the 2057 law is this requirement that, and there's, I, I know there's more to this, but kind of like, we kind of basically call it that. So it's age verification, right? Okay. Yeah. But, but essentially what, what we used to be able to do is uh, models used to fly in from Europe all the time to shoot in other countries, right? And they instituted this law that required that any people who engage in explicit sex work, so explicit porn, in the U.S. must have two U.S.-issued government IDs. So you could no longer come in from, you know, Eastern Europe and work here anymore um, in the way that you could before. And, you know, the whole premise behind that was we're preventing sex trafficking. So, again, it was this idea that these girls from Europe are being flown into the U.S. to shoot porn unwillingly. And I can, you know, tell you just from, and look, the, porn is many different things. There's smaller underground companies, there's amateur porn, like, you know, there's the above board mainstream porn, what we call it, which is what I work in. And then there's the more like seedy underbelly, but that underbelly doesn't really exist in the way that people think it does. But like the idea that a lot of girls in porn are being like sex trafficked, I can just tell you, it's like, just not true. <laughs> You know what I mean? There's so many girls that, that, that actively want to work in the industry and that, I mean, there's too many girls, you know what I mean? We're at the point now where we're like flooded. Like we are not trying to steal girls from Czechoslovakia <laughs> to come here and unwillingly work in porn, you know, like they come with, it's just like, it's just, that's but, not true. But that's, you know, it's crazy. And so this is maybe like a little bit of a, a digression, but something I've written about too is how this is sort of, I mean, and, a long time thing. Like this is one of the earliest, this is one of the ways that the U.S. government has long time controlled immigration and borders was through the prospect of, of sex trafficking or sex workers. Like, I, I, like probably the, like the earliest um, immigration law was because they were trying to stop like Chinese prostitutes from coming in, they said. And so like, yeah, there's just been this long history of sort of using this idea. And, and then this sort of back then, like in the Victorian era, there's this whole panic over trafficking too. Um, and, th and that started this whole sort of immigration crackdown. So it's just interesting to see like that morph into so many different forms over the years, but 
yeah, it's sort of using it to like control people. Thing. Yeah. And then the next, I think, big um, step in terms of the the law using that excuse to crack down on sex work is SESTA-FOSTA, which a lot of people, um, again, if you're not in the industry, are not entirely familiar with. So could you explain that in its kind of basic terms, what that is and, and what that meant for the industry? Yeah, basically FOSTA, it did two, SESTA-FOSTA did two things. It, um, it made it a federal crime with a mandatory minimum of, I think, 10 years in prison to host online ads for sex or prostitution that wound up, uh, you know, it, um, yeah, that wound up causing harm in any way. And also, then I'm sort of doing a bad job explaining this. Um, sorry. Okay. But also, um, it also changed a federal law called Section 230, which applies to the internet and says that websites aren't liable if, you know, users post things that end up causing them harm. So again, you know, if someone posted an ad back on uh, back Backpage, back when it existed, or Craigslist, or you know, um, that, those are the ones that are sort of always demonized in, in the popular press. So they would say, you know, people are posting ads there and then they meet up with people and then they get, you know, abducted or raped or they get trafficked or things like that. And we want to be able to hold those websites liable. So it was about, you know, theoretically, it was about holding those websites liable, even though there are already rules in place where if those websites were doing it knowingly, they could be in trouble. Um, in effect, I think what, you know, the big, the big thing that people have seen was that it wasn't really about actually, you know, prosecutors wanting to use it and actually, and even though they are, they are starting to use it, but it wasn't so much about that. It was about making websites afraid because the punishments were so bad if they break this law. So like any talk of sex, you know, that what if it ended up, you know, resulting in some sort of harm or someone being underage, being involved, and then they could, you know, be sued out of existence. So you started to really see, you know, Craigslist shut its, um, you know, dating and, and casual encounters ads, you saw other people start to just crack down and, and you know, um, reject sex worker ads and reject sex worker accounts more generally on social media. And I think we've seen that only um, pick up since FOSTA has been used, even though nobody has been convicted under the law um, yet. But it's just, you know, the threat of it is so big that it's, you know, really in effect just made social media and the internet at large really crack down on sex related content of all sorts. The key thing, too, is that, yeah, anything that is seen to facilitate prostitution or promote prostitution, not just sex trafficking, is now, if, you know, hosting that is now a federal crime. So like you said, like anything where if sex workers are talking about how to keep each other safe, well, is that them, you know, promoting prostitution? Is the website or the app that hosts that then, are they promoting prostitution by, you know, giving sex workers a means to talk about it? So, yeah, like you said, like any of these things that help keep people safe when they're doing this and help people screen clients and, and sort of communicate amongst themselves could be seen as being against the law. And nobody knows, you know, if that would then mean that it's illegal under false. Yeah. I think what it did was it provided a community where, you know, obviously people could advertise their services and customers could find them, but also a place where right. girls could talk to each other and could, you know, warn each other about dangerous um, customers. And that was all taken away from them. And that was like a really big problem. So uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some of these crazy statistics that we've seen. We're going to talk about QAnon and um, we're going to talk about the Wayfair scandal. So hang on. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, 
access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, so we're back. So let's start off um, with some of these statistics that we see being thrown around online. And um, the one thing that kind of makes me crazy about social media, and I think it's a huge problem, is just the fact that in this age of information, there's so much misinformation that's going around and people do not bother to fact check anything, which to be honest, I totally understand. I'm also very busy. I just see a headline and I'll be like, oh my God, um, nobody has time or often the resources to go and fact check stuff, but people just really just go off by these headlines and they retweet them, they repost them. And then it just gets into this frenzy where it's been shared so many times across the internet that like everybody believes it, even though it's complete and utter bullshit. And so one of these is this, this number, this 300,000, um, I think it actually like it, in its, um, in its worst form, I've seen it at 300,000 ch underage children are sex trafficked every year in the United States. Um, I think originally it was 300,000 are at risk of being sex trafficked in the United States, but even that number is not correct. So can you tell us a little bit about that number, where it came from and, and what is so wrong with it? Yeah, it was, you know, it was from this study, which the author now dis disavows, and the study sort of essentially, or one of the authors disavows now, and the study essentially tallied up all these things that it said put people, put kids at risk of being sex trafficked, of being forced into prostitution. And it was everything from living in the vicinity of an adult business to having divorced parents. Um, it was just like this crazy long list of things. And if a kid had multiple factors, they tallied them up twice. And so that's how they got this really crazy high number, 300,000. And, you know, as, as studies do, it sort of put it out there with like a lot of hems and haws, like these are the risk factors. So 300,000 up to 300,000, yeah, maybe at risk of whatever. But like that, you know, got solidified in the media. And now all the time it's repeated by politicians and used to justify SESTA FOSTA and all sorts of terrible legislation is people will just say 300,000 kids a year are being sex trafficked as if, as if, you know, that that was an actual number if that was any is if there was any sort of real basis for it and it's just sort of taken on a life of its own now um yeah yeah i mean it and the idea that there is this huge market where Same. people want 300 that there's a need for 300,000 right. children like there's this huge you know because pedophiles are they're not as common as I think people think they are. I mean, they obviously exist and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a terrible fucking thing, but the idea that there's like this insatiable desire, there's some, this huge network of people, of pedophiles, they're, they're so numerous that they need to absorb 300,000 children a year. Like who, <laughs> I think, I think Maggie McDe McNeil uh, did the math and, you know, it was something like, that would mean like one in 10 men in the United States or something is visiting, uh, you know, a, a, a child sex slave like every year. And that's assuming that like none of these are like repeat or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, like it's insane. Like if you, if you do the math, like, and that would be without them, without any men seeing any other adult sex workers too, you know, like it just the volume of men you'd have to have visiting child sex slaves to make that never true is insane and that that alone should give people pause but you know it doesn't it gets sort of um you know it's been repeated on the on the floor of congress by by numerous you know uh congressmen and, and senators because they just you know read it somewhere and then they say it. and then once something's repeated and it's in the like you know congressional records just like oh people are like well that must be true like they must know what they're talking about like they don't just cite bullshit but like, they do all the time yeah and and the thing is is that i mean most most molestation cases um, with children, which is definitely not a rare thing, but it's usually family members, friends of the, you know, close friends of the family. Um, this this idea that there's this huge international ring 
of child sex trafficking that is so um, so well connected and well organized that they're secretly selling children on Wayfair in cabinets is just <laughs> kind of nuts. I don't know if you've heard, uh, the podcast you're wrong about did a really great follow-up sex trafficking episode. And they talked about the Wayfair cabinet thing. And basically, so a lot of these, um, cabinets, like if you ever bought anything at Ikea, they have like weird funky names, right? Yeah. So one of these had a name, had a name that was not like what you would normally give a cabinet, which is, I don't know what the fuck would you normally name a cabinet? Like (laughs) red barn cabinet. I don't know. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like, it was some kind of like obscurish name that happened to match the name of a girl who was missing. Oh, a missing child. That's right. A yes. missing child. Right. And then apparently also too. And so the cabinet was listed on Wayfair and I think Wayfair kind of acts like an Amazon where like different merchants can list their furniture on Wayfair. Right. So the pricing is really dependent on who's listing it. And apparently there's also like this algorithm that exists where, um, it will kind of price match or try to up themselves based on like what other sellers are selling things for. So, so there's also this algorithm that comes in that kind of can control the pricing automatically. And sometimes it goes like haywire and out of control. So I think that's essentially what this happened with this cabinet where it said it was like $35,000 or something like that. And the name of the cabinet happened to match in this girl who was missing. And so everybody was like, Oh my God, this cabinet is, (laughs) this missing girl. And if you order this cabinet for $35,000, you'll get this missing girl. Well, apparently this missing girl was also found and went home. And so like, she had to come out and be like, um, I'm not missing. I'm not being sex trafficked. Please stop saying that I am. But of course that story never makes it into the fucking news. It's like a perfect example that I always, um, that I always talk about when it comes to like how the media latches on to like, the one story and then doesn't ever follow up because I personally encountered this all the time. When Playboy went non nude, the magazine, that was huge news, right? Like everybody was like, Oh my God, Playboy's non nude. What does that mean? Cause I work for Playboy. And then a year later they're like, yeah, fuck that. That was a bad idea. Let's put nudity back in the magazine, but nobody ever reported that. <laughs> so a lot of people still think that Playboy is still non nude because that's not news. What's news is the initial shocking thing that happens, not the follow-up, like, oh, this is actually not the case anymore kind of situation. So I think that's what happened with the Wayfair case. But um, this kind of bleeds into the whole QAnon thing, which is also, I mean, and I have, you know, I, there are people that I know that I respect that deeply believe in these theories. Um, So can you explain to those who, who maybe don't know QAnon and and specifically what what their beliefs are and maybe if you know anything about Pizzagate and what that means. Yes, Pizzagate, the, the place where this Pizzagate happened, uh, I used to like go there all the time in college. I hadn't been there in a long time, but it's just this like unassuming pizza place in Northwest DC, this like quiet little street. And uh, for some reason, people decided on the internet that it was harboring uh, child sex slaves in the basement, and that this, you know, part as part of this international pedophile ring that involved Hillary Clinton and Don Podesta and all sorts of famous people and politicians and celebrities. And, and I actually went and, and shot with a gun and shot up the place. Nobody was harmed, but I mean, that's how far it went. That's how seriously some people took this. And this was back um, a few years ago, though, now. Um, and then, you know, people started laughing, like, oh, well, that was clearly crazy, you know, like, nobody's, you know, because there was, the, there was never any evidence for this, not a shred of evidence. Um, and, you know, people were like, that was just, you know, a crazy internet conspiracy theory, whatever. But, meanwhile, <laughs> the Pizzagate followers uh, were sort of uh, morphing and growing or merging with other people and, you know, uh, merging with this group called Q, QAnon. Um, they believe that a man who, or a person who went by the, this uh, anonymous name online of Q was sending messages about how Donald Trump was preparing. And, and you know, soon he was going to announce the arrest of Hillary Clinton and all of these international pedophiles. And he was going to bring this international pedophile ring to justice. Um, that's sort of the base of it. There are like all sorts of wild sub theories about what he's uh donald trump is supposedly going to do to stop this and who is involved in all these things but i think if you know the basis is just that 
that there is a man named Q who is is telling people the truth about about what is happening with this international pedophile ring. And then that's sort of morphed too into like all sorts of other weird things though, where where it's got like a grain of truth, right? So then it started started getting people involved who are who are mad about child foster care. Because as you were saying earlier, like there aren't there aren't international cabals or, or evil furniture companies like trafficking people in, you know, cabinets or, you know, shipping containers. When people when people are underage and they get involved in, in prostitution or, you know, are exploited in, in these industries, it's because they are usually run away from home, run away from bad situations and just, you know, trying to get by people, you know, just call it survival sex or whatever. Um, and so, you know, it, it's amazing that it's so many of these people that are end up being classified as child sex trafficking victims come from the u.s foster care and state care system um and i think that does you know it says a lot about what what is going on and how we treat people but you know then people take that and morph it into like ah that must be because the states are part of this international sex trafficking ring and it just sort of takes on these crazy conspiratorial tones yeah i mean the the one thing that always gets me about that that the QAnon uh, sex trafficking um, elite ring of pedophiles with involving Hillary Clinton is not the sex, the fact that they have like sex with underage children, which I mean, of course, like obviously that's outrageous and, um, and ridiculous. And I mean, not that it doesn't happen. We'll get to the Jeffrey Epstein thing. Right. Um, but the idea that this, this happens on a huge scale, don't they also say that they eat the children as well? That that's there's, that's yeah. where there's that's where I'm like okay okay wait a minute yeah there was like, somebody who did some sort of art like spirit cooking or something and it was like it was a performance art thing and they decided like no it was like real children and they were eating them like, yeah. <laughs> that's where you lose me yeah. <laughs> I gotta say that's where you fucking lose me um, uh, I always like to say though that like. It's not, okay, I mean, maybe after we just talked about eating children, this isn't going to sound exactly right. But I was going to say, so many of these sex trafficking conspiracies, though, that we think of as being just nuts, like QAnon and the Wayfair one, like, they're not all that much more crazy than the things that, say, get printed in the New York Times or repeated on the floor of Congress about child sex trafficking, you know, like Mm -hmm. the the numbers we were talking about and stuff. Yeah. It's all sort of... You can see why so many people believe this now, and you almost can't. I don't want to mock the people who do believe it because it's like for two decades now, mainstream media has been spoon feeding them this diet of like sex trafficking is happening everywhere, it's happening across our borders, it's happening in your own backyard. Hundreds of thousands of year, uh, new children a year are being trafficked. I mean, it's like that's what all of the legitimate media and all the politicians have been telling you. You can see how it's not like quite as crazy as you know. Yeah, I blame I blame the media is what I'm saying. The media and the politicians, I guess, right. more, than, more than people who you know get caught up in this, I guess. Yeah, and I think like one has to differentiate between like real cases of sex trafficking, which obviously I'm sure exist, um, and this idea that what was the mayor of Baltimore issued this statement that there was like a white van sex trafficking. Um, ring going on. And so like anytime anyone saw someone in a white van, they were kidnapping yeah. children. Like I drive a white van for my equipment for photo shoots. Like, you know, am I going to get attacked in the middle of the street? And my then like this. Drives a white van, he's an electrician. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. And the zip tie, the zip tie theory. So the idea is that like, if you come across your car and someone has zip tied your door handle to another door handle so that like you can't open your car door and you have to like either cut the zip tie or go in through the other side that is a sign of sex trafficking because then you have to look down in your purse try to find something to cut it and then someone's gonna like jump on you and kidnap you so i think that the the idea you know that we all live in a Liam Neeson taken movie and that they're just snatching children off of the streets. And out of the Hobby Lobby. There was one, like, <laughs> I went viral on Facebook where this woman was like, I was walking with my toddler in, a, in the Hobby Lobby and, like, this man looked at us weird and, like, I know that I did the right thing by getting out there quickly and we could have been such a... You're like, nobody's trying to steal your toddler in the middle of broad daylight in the Hobby Lobby for sex. Like, sorry, lady. Yeah, I think they go viral on Facebook. Like people love it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it creates like this kind of drama and sense of importance that I think everybody wants. I think, I mean, in cases of real sex trafficking, right? Where do you think that that happens mostly? Like, where would we look to actually see those cases as opposed to people just getting snatched off the street because someone zip tied your door handles together? Well, I mean, again, yeah, as I said, uh, as I said earlier, you know, like a lot of it is just teens, like runaway teenagers, you know, it's not, you know, it's not children. It's, it's, you know, sometimes younger teens, but usually older teens who mm-hmm. are run away from their own homes or from state care because, uh, you know, whatever reasons it's, it thinks, you know, it's, it's disproportionately people who are LGBT because that creates a lot of problems. Um, and they end up, you know, hooking up with someone on the streets who provides them, you know, with money and, you know, who gets them involved or they get involved on their own, you know, and, but still they're considered, you know, a trafficking victim because they're underage. Um, like you mentioned, there's a lot of, you know, families, like when it is an abuse situation, like all too often it's the family. So, I mean, yeah, I read about a ton of these cases, these court cases, and it's never, I've never once seen it be a, someone gets snatched up off the streets or whatever, like, you know, right. teens who run away, it's teens who are abused by their families, or if it's adults, it's women who are being coerced because um, of like immigration things or a drug problem or something like that. But again, it's not people being literally physically abducted and then literally physically, you know, change the radiators of force. It's people being controlled often because of like our own laws, you know, because then people can say like, well, you're a sex worker. I'll tell the cops that they won't believe you and you'll get arrested or you're an undocumented immigrant or you're underage and you ran away from home, you know, whatever. Like it's all these things. And all too often when, you know, if those, the cops do encounter these people, they do arrest them. So, you know, I think that the root of this is, it, it, you know, it does happen, but it doesn't happen on this organized la- level. It happens in the much more familial level of crime that we sort of know. And people don't want to pretend that that's the root because, you know, that requires fixing so much more about our society than just sort of, you know, having cops swoop in and rescue, you know, girls who are being trafficked by shady traffic. Yeah. So, so really the idea is that we need to look into like our foster care system and, um, the social issues, like you said, with like LGBT people. Yeah. And that, that push people out of their homes and away from their families and just generally how, you know, we, we treat people, um, who might have a different sexual orientation or feel differently and Right. Like a big one is, you know, like at um, homeless shelters or emergency shelters for kids or, or, you know, violence victims, you know, a lot of them will have policies where someone can't go if they're not, uh, you know, identifying as the gender on their birth certificate or driver's license. So that leaves out a oh, lot of really? trans kids. Okay. A lot of them will not let people in if they have a criminal record. So if someone's been a sex worker in the past or, even if, you know, they've been trafficked in the past and they're underage, but they've been you know, gotten arrested, like they might be barred. So it's like, we then prevent them from even, you know, getting the, the help that they need because of yeah, this big past violence against them. It's just like a really vicious cycle. Right. And then they have no choice but to re-enter that industry, which maybe got them at that place, that, that place in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Um, so do you think that, cause you know, admittedly hearing this whole, like there's this elite pedophile ring, you know, sounds a little bit ludicrous. And then the okay. Jeffrey Epstein <laughs> case happens. They're like, oh, okay. So they're like, you know, there's some truth to this. So how do you, how do you feel about that? And was that like a surprise to you? Um, I mean, it definitely gives, so, lends some credence and gives fodder to people who believe that this exists on a massive scale. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one of the most important things with the Jeffrey Epstein thing, and again, you know, yeah, this does not help disprove the conspiracy theories at all, but is people will be like, oh, he just, you know, he got a pass for so many years. But if you look back, like people were investigating him back in the early 2000s, you know, like that's when these court cases started. And, you know, when he got arrested um, in Florida in 2008, and then it ended up being a really light sentence. So there were all these opportunities where, yeah, he could have been charged. People knew what was going on and police just didn't. And I guess you can look at that as like, oh, that's because they were all involved, the people in power and he was, you know, part of this. But I also just think it's like a reflection of our criminal justice system. And like, we don't really believe when, you know, a lot of times these were like poor, 
you know, they were, they were teenagers. They were from like lower class families or something. Were, I think there's a couple of examples where they said like, Oh, well, I was just glad that, you know, like he was taking, and the moms didn't think that he was, you know, like doing sexual things with them, but they were like, Oh, I'm glad he was taking an interest in them. And as a, as a model or as someone to give massages or whatever. Um, and you know, so you have these, yeah, you have these young girls and these people from these, you know, not wealthy world saying this thing about a wealthy white man. And that's just sort of, that's, that's what happens. Like that's how they're, that's how the criminal justice system, I think reacts in general, not, there doesn't have to be a big conspiracy, right? Like he was let right. out again and again because that's what happens when you have these sorts of men claims against them. Yeah. And also too, like, I mean, money will, yeah. will often buy you your way yeah. out of jail for sure. Uh, and also too, you know, a lot of these girls were, like you said, from poor families and a lot of them were sex trafficked in by other girls yeah. who were also groomed by him. So again, it's this like, kind of like, oh, do you want to come work as a masseuse? Like, and then I'll give you extra money. If you do this, you do that. As opposed to the idea that these people were snatched right. out of Hobby Lobby of and then like Hobby. kidnapped and then brought and kept in his basement. It was more like a grooming thing over a long period of time, taking advantage of, you know, young, um, right. poor girls who just kind right. of. So like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not right, and it's certainly not right on you know like his end for, or on any adult's end to do that. But there, but there's a difference. Like these girls did have agency, right? I mean, they they were still coerced because this is an adult doing this to someone who is not an adult, and that you know there's the power dynamic and everything. It's you know, but it wasn't like someone was literally like Epstein was literally yeah like abducting them and forcing them. So again, it's not at all like we think. It's bad, and there are things that are bad but they're not bad in the ways you think. It's sometimes people will say like, well, what's the harm if we just make it seem like it's worse than it is? And you're like, well, because then exactly, then you have like, you're, you're solving that problem. You have these boon squads of like ICE agents, like knocking down doors to arrest, you know, teenagers who are helping other teenagers do sex. And then you don't have to free up Steve. You know? Right, right, exactly. Um, let's talk about the uh, Robert Kraft case. Because that's kind of an interesting example of this whole sex trafficking sting that went down that didn't end up being exactly what they thought it was. Yeah, it was uh, at several massage parlors in Florida, um, and one in particular where they got surveillance video for weeks and they filmed people there, and some of them um, got regular massages, and some of them got massages where there was a little bit of sexual activity at the end. And Robert Kraft was one of those people. Uh, the police, with help from Homeland Security, um, conducted these, you know, weeks of surveillance, and then they arrested all these people. They charged um, all of the men with solicitation of prostitution. They said, and they held these big press conferences, and it got, like, all this national media attention. It was on all the cable news networks that they had busted an international sex trafficking ring that was operating out of Chinese massage parlors in Florida. Um, that quickly fell apart, and it was just a regular massage parlor that also, you know, had some sex work involved and the women who worked there and who owned the place, they were all arrested and charged with felonies. They ended up with sort of the worst uh, punishments of the whole bunch, which really just sort of gives away the game on their whole, like, we're doing this to save this, these women. And then they are the ones who get the most. Um, they fought it in court, the women involved and the men who were arrested, including Robert Kraft. And it went all the way up to a federal appeals court, which just like, last week or the week before ruled that the, the footage was unadmissible because they had actually gotten, they had used this like um, provision of the Patriot Act to say, we need to go in here and put secret videos up because it's, you know, such a serious crime. There's human trafficking happening here. And then they just filmed it indiscriminately. They just left the cameras on for these weeks on end. And the judge said like, no, you didn't make any attempt to minimize it. You didn't make any attempt to like only catch criminals. You just filmed everybody who was getting the massage in there. Um, and, and so they, they threw out the footage as, and said it was unconstitutional, which is good because I think people found that really crazy or like, what they just like, you know, we're able to just get a surveillance warrant and there's all these federal agents involved in like people getting hand jobs at the end of their massages. But this happens all the time. Like I've, across the country, I've written about so many cases where they do this. It's become this sort of big part of 
you know, the fact that Homeland Security is involved sort of tells you, too, it's really sort of an immigration effort. It's an effort at catching sex workers and catching immigrants. But they really dress it up as like, no, we're saving these women from human trafficking. And they target um, Asian massage. Weren't all of the women there like legal immigrants? Oh, yeah, they were all legal immigrants. They were all had um, massage licenses in the state of Florida. Um, yeah, there was, you know, when and when they talk about in this case and in similar ones, they talk about like the reasons they thought that they were trafficked and they'll say things like, well, they ate lunch in the building or like the workers came from out of town and lived together at, at an apartment together. You're like, these are like, you know, people eat lunch at work to save money. Like people don't always go out for lunch. Like, and like people, when they're traveling from town to town doing jobs or, or, or when they're immigrants and maybe new to this country, like, yeah, they might share an apartment. Like not everyone, I don't know. It ends up being sort of really classist in a weird way too. These, these yeah. I was, that they use that are, that are supposedly trafficking signs. I was going to say, like, maybe they just couldn't all afford yeah. uh, an apartment. Right. And they're like, like their boss picked them up and drove them to work. And you're like, well, again, like, they were, like, some of them had come down from Queens to work for, like, a few months. And it's like, they're not going to bring their, like, if they don't have their own car, like, their boss giving them a ride to work does not mean she's necessarily trafficking them. Like, maybe she's just giving them a ride to work. But, um, yeah. The fact that, you know, there was some sexual activity happening in conjunction with that, like, they immediately just, like, leap to, oh, well, they're immigrants. Their sex, they must be sex trafficked. Right, and then and none of them ever issued complaints against the business, right? Like none no. of them were said, "Oh my God, thank God you rescued me." No, I was being forced to do this. They were all just like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, I mean, most of the women <laughs> that they found there were arrested themselves for prostitution or for even, you know, right um, harsher crimes because they would say that they participated in each other's prostitution. Right, right. Yeah. It's just so. It's so so it's, yeah, I mean, there's an, a great example of the um, idea of sex trafficking being used specifically to harm um, sex workers who are willingly participating yeah. in their jobs. Uh, and and it's interesting, too, because, you know, this whole idea of this international sex trafficking and, and bringing in um, children, you know, going back to like children from other countries, you know, we've seen these false claims of sex trafficking. Probably the most embarrassing one was for Cindy McCain, who, you know, saw a... Um, it was so beautiful. She, so she was at the Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. She said, I came in from a trip I'd been on and I spotted, and it looked odd. I was a, It was a woman of different ethnicity than the child, this little toddler that she had, and something didn't click with me. I tell people, trust your gut. I went over to the police and told them what I thought, and they went over and questioned her. And by God, she was trafficking that kid. Well, well turns out that wasn't true. <laughs> she wasn't trafficking that kid. And uh, she actually had to turn around and issue an apology. Um, and there's been a couple other cases. Uh, there was the, the case. Police actually uh, said, I was going to say, yeah, like the best part is the police were like, we don't know what she's talking about. That never happened. Like the police were just like, no, that never happened. Like, they actually said that. It was just so great. So wait, did, did she not report it or did they not like she's, say like, cause she, it sounds like she was like, I went to them and they were like, oh my yeah. God, you're right. She is. Right. And, and did they say they're just like, that's. They, we never said that. We don't know. Like, I don't know if she, yeah, like, if she reported it and it wasn't trafficking or like the whole incident never happened, but she talked about it on the radio show that you mentioned. That's where it first came up. And police were just like, that did not happen. Like, so yeah, it's, yeah. Jesus fucking Christ. So, and there's been a couple other cases of mistaken sex tra trafficking. There's Stephanie Young, who had just turned 26. She was detained on a Delta flight. Um, for being a supposed sex trafficking victim. Um, she believed that it was because of her race. And uh, there was another case in December, 2019, white Arizona man. He was accused at the same Phoenix airport of trafficking his 16 year old daughter who him and his wife had adopted from China. Um, and, you know, Southwest airlines had to send a heartfelt apology and adding that flight attendants had been trained to flag possible human trafficking. Now this is also interesting because it leads into like some of these, some of these, again, like th things to look for online for victims of sex trafficking. Um, one of them is like tattoos, like barcode tattoos specifically. Like, do you know how many counter culture kids I know who have like barcode tattoos to be ironic? And again, 
this points to the idea that there is really this incredibly well organized. Right. So much so they would need barcodes. And they need barcodes because their inventory is yeah. so big that they need to like tattoo barcodes on these people to keep track of them. It's just um it's a little insane. And it actually, that story reminds me of, and this wasn't a sex trafficking story, but just the idea of like when kind of race starts to play into this. Um, Xander Corvus is an adult performer who I had on my show and his father is black and his mother is white. And he is, uh, you know, what they call white passing. Like he, yeah. he looks pretty white. And he said that he, the first time that he realized that his parents were like, in an interracial relationship. And then that was different than other people was when he was at the fair and he was with his mother and his father and his mother went to the bathroom. And so he was with his father and his father's holding this, and you know, he's got like blue eyes and blonde hair and these cops came up to his father and started harassing him because they thought that he'd kidnapped this kid. Cause they're like, why would this little white boy be with this big black man? This big black man must have kidnapped him. And, and, you know, and they didn't believe him until his mother came out of the bathroom was like, what the hell are you doing? And, you know, just how traumatizing that was for him. So, so yeah, I think uh, sometimes this also plays into like, into like a race issue as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it plays into sort of all of our stereotypes because mm -hmm. you see with these, yeah, with these uh, cases on the airlines or various things, it's always a, a multiracial family or an interracial couple or something. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's so, it's so weird because, you know, it, it's the, the man act of, of, you know, 1910, 100 years ago during the first, like, sex trafficking panic. They passed that allegedly to stop people from, you know, bringing people across state lines for sex trafficking. And it just wound up, you know, harassing black people and queer people and interracial couples and women who, you know, were deemed too slutty looking or promiscuous. Um, and it's just it's so sad to see more than 100 years later, like we're doing that with our same laws today. We've passed, mm -hmm. like, as this, like, sex traffic panic has gone over the past few decades, every few years there's been a new federal sex trafficking law. And because all of these things are already illegal, they have to just keep, you know, ratcheting up the things that they're doing to stop the sex trafficking. So there's been this spate of laws that have been, like, um, airline staff, you know, stewardesses or airline attendants have to be trained to spot the signs of sex trafficking. And now all people who work at airports do, and now barbers do, and now hotel staff do, and now nurses do. And they've just expanded these mandatory requirements that these people, re you know, receive this government training on how to spot sex trafficking. And like those ridiculous things you said, like, it's all, it's all that. It's like, they have these crazy tattoos or they're dressed shabbily or they're dressed too skimpily or they, you know, and again, it just winds up profiling people for the same reasons we did a uh, hundred years ago, because we think that they're like not meeting these levels of like, they don't look right for their gender or they're not, you know, staying within whatever these conventional bounds of femininity or, you know, yeah, it's a, it's just a straight up racism or ethnicity thing, you know? So, um, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, really, I think if we're going to talk about human trafficking, I think probably the biggest issue is in the, in the labor section, right? Um, I was listening to another podcast and they were talking about, you know, how like one of the laws for um, farm work immigration, uh, farm work working visas is that if you if you quit the job that you're working at, so if like a, a farm brings you in to work, and you quit that job, then you get sent back to your country. You don't get to like kind of move on to a different, like, cause you have to get sponsored by that company. Right. And so this leads a lot of people to get stuck in a job that is exploiting them, that is underpaying them, that is abusing them. And so I think the human trafficking issue, we see so much more in, in that area, but you know, when you put sex in front of it, it's like, it's a sexier, it's a sexier yeah. thing to get behind, you know, like, and cause the idea that anybody would be forced into sex work is, is a terrible idea. And believe me, like everyone in the adult industry, like we don't, I don't want to shoot people who don't want to be there. Like none of us want to work with people who don't want to be doing what they're doing, but I don't know. It just feels like something like really and it's so attention grabbing. So I think the the idea of stopping sex trafficking is is lauded so much more than the idea of stopping human trafficking, 
where when it comes to like human trafficking and like the la the labor issue, that's that's really where we have more of a problem than sex trafficking. And so I feel like it's kind of it's a little misleading, like where people's attention gets pushed, right? Totally. And even even in sort of the same cases, like with the massage parlors, you'll see all this attention then because they'll say it's a sex trafficking case. And then when it turns out there was no sex trafficking, but there might be some like labor exploitation happening, at least obviously no labor violations happening. And, um, and you know, it's unclear exactly, but it looks like that, but nobody cares. You've seen like prosecutors just let that go because like, whatever, they didn't find, you know, girls having been shipped here in boxes and enforced to the sex. They're just like, eh, you know, immigrants had getting labor violations, whatever. Like, yeah, nobody wants to pay attention to that. Really? So these cases will come will come to court and they won't be able to find the sex trafficking angle that they want, but they have labor trafficking and labor violations. And then they just drop the case because that's not interesting to them to prosecute. I mean, there was one case in that I was writing about recently with Josh Hawley, uh, the senator from Missouri, who um, is, you know, one of the biggest Trump sort of stands out there. And he when he was attorney general in Missouri, he did this big bust on the Springfield massage parlors and is still trying to seize the assets owners for saying that they allowed sex trafficking to happen. And he didn't get like press conference saying sex trafficking was happening. But there was never any evidence of that. But when you read all the police documents, what he's a couple workers at places told them was that they were sort of being, for, that they'd been lied to about the nature of the job. They were being forced to live at the place. They were forced to work long hours. They weren't being allowed to have any days off, things like that. And nobody was ever charged in those. Um, Josh Hawley was just tried for years to like seize the assets of the massage parlor owners and tell the press that they were sex traffickers and not the ones that are involved in it. Like do nothing about this labor violence. So mm. yeah, it's just kind of like, that's not sexy. So, yeah. Like yeah. you said, it's just really really sad yeah You're like what these people need isn't you know someone like cops to, like bust in and save them they may need people to be like here are like what your rights are as like an immigrant worker and here's people who could help you fight for them if you are like being taken advantage of and instead it's just like we don't want to hear it you know yeah like oh you're not being sex trafficked right. okay eh. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Our bad. Sorry. We're yeah. going to try to find somebody that is because those headlines are the ones that we want, right? And get all the attention. So um, let's just shift a little bit to our uh, Democratic vice presidential nominee because, uh, yeah, so, so that's just, uh, she's just been nominated for vice president um, for the Democratic Party. And, you know, her name has come up in the past when she was actually, I believe, running for the Democratic nomination. There was a big outcry against Kamala Harris um, regarding her stance on sex work. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about maybe why people in my industry aren't her biggest fans? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest reasons, one of the things she did in recent years was she um, had the people, the founders of Backpage arrested and charged them with child pimping twice on completely unfounded charges that were dropped both times. But Does this um, go back to the FOSTA-SESTA situation or was this before? This was in 2016 and this was when okay. she was running for the Senate. So okay. she was Attorney General of California uh, about a few weeks before the election, the 2016 election, where she's up for uh, Senate seat, she arrests the uh, yeah the founders and the CEO of Backpage and says, "I'm busting them for child sex trafficking." And you know, at this point, there have been all these congressional hearings about Backpage. They sort of become the main scapegoat in this idea that they were that they were the selling children for sex. So she was the one who got all these headlines saying that she took them down. And then it turns out her case was just you know, nonsense, and a judge threw it out. And then she had two weeks left in office as Attorney General of California, and she refiled slightly different charges that were, like, would make sure she got them again. And a judge eventually threw out, like, anything related to the child, alleged child pimping, because, again, it was just, like, a few people who had posted ads on Backpage and maybe wound up, like, in various bad situations, but, like, there was nothing to, to indicate that anything had been involved um, so that sort of really was, I think, the start of, you know, people realizing that she was, you know, no friend to sex workers, um, or at least people across the country or you know, maybe realizing that. But even as, as, a, as um, a district attorney in San Francisco, you know, she likes to say now that she was a progressive prosecutor. But if you look at her record, I mean, that, that wasn't the case at all. She actually ramped up, like, quality of life crime arrests, so arrests for, like, 
small drug possession, you know, small drug crimes for prostitution and solicitation for um, truancy and loitering and things like that. Um, she wasn't really, you know, she she likes to say that she supported sex workers because she did a lot where she was um, saying, well, we're going to arrest the men and pay for sex, not the women. But again, like that's, you know, that's not helpful. Like if your clients are criminalized, you're still effectively criminalized. And that's sort of the position she's now taking. Um, and that's that's the yeah. that's the Nordic model, right? Yeah. So and that's and the, so the Nordic model is when you arrest the customers of um, prostitution rather than the prostitutes themselves. Yeah, and it's been gaining a ton of traction in the U.S. There's like a big group of camp- campaigners, and they like to call it the equality model now. Whatever. Um, but yeah, and so she now says she'll say I'm for decriminalization of prostitution, and then when pressed, she'll be like, "Well, no, she's not for decriminalization." They're trying to sort of reframe this as if you know. Well, we won't arrest the sex workers. We won't arrest people who are the prostitutes. You know, we won't arrest them, but we'll arrest people who pay them. Which you know, again, it just ends up the same thing. You know, they can't they can't work safely. They can't you know work together in brothels. They can't advertise legally because it's still actually legal. And so it just doesn't help. And you know, like as we've seen again, like if if the customers are still you know doing a, a crime, cops will still do stings, and sex workers will still get caught up in them themselves. So it's just sort of like a bullshit having it both ways position that. that Harris now tries to do, and it's just very typical of sort of how she is on these. We've covered a lot. We've covered that was a, lot. a lot. Yeah, that was a lot. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't know if there's some kind of like takeaway that we should give people, but I guess you know, again. I just want to reiterate, it's not the idea that we um, are for sex trafficking, that it doesn't exist. I think the idea is just to kind of debunk this hysteria around it, that it exists on this grand, massive scale, and that it's, you know, children being snatched up off the streets, and that ultimately all of the, this, a lot of this hysteria around it trying to eradicate a a problem on a massive scale, which, which doesn't really exist on a massive scale ends up hurting sex workers in the end. And really what we should look to is, um, the institutions that foster any kind of, um, real sex trafficking, which as you said, is kind of, you know, like kids running away from foster homes and LGBT teens being pushed out of their homes because of their gender identities or their sexual orientation. So, so really, I, I feel like it's more about looking at basically how we how we treat our children in this country, don't you think? Yeah, how we treat them and how we, yeah, what we do when, when things aren't going well for them. Yeah. Because, yeah, I feel like we'd rather, we, we'd prefer to think that there's these mythical bad guys out there rather than like it's sometimes American parents and it's sometimes American authorities and it's... It's it's yeah. us. It's not these mythical monsters. Like it's people. Yeah. That's a lot harder to deal with. Right. Yeah. Because if you have you have these, you know, everybody wants this very clear, like Darth Vader enemy to all, you know, fight against. But if it's something right. that is like with within our society, broken institutions, um, you know, uh, very skewed and unfair beliefs about gender identity, sexual orientation, um, sex in general, sex yeah, work in sex general. Work yeah. It's kind of all stems from that. So anyways, thank you, Elizabeth. I really appreciated it. It was so great to have you on and, um, really educational, um, really interesting. I think, um, I think my audience is going to be really fascinated by this, this episode. So can you tell everybody where they can find you online, um, your social media, um, any other uh, websites that you want to plug? Yeah, uh, I'm a senior editor at Reason Magazine. We're at reason.com. Um, on Twitter, I'm at E.N. Brown, and the same on Instagram. Uh, and I'm also the founder of, uh, of the Libertarian Feminist Group, Feminist for Liberty. You can find us at feministforliberty.com and on Twitter at Feminist Liberty. 
Fantastic. Sorry, that was a lot of things, but no, actually, to I'll be honest with you, Elizabeth, that was nothing. Like a lot of times, you know, I have adult stars on here who have like 10 websites, <laughs> okay. 10 different platforms. So that was like, that was short, okay. which you should hear how long mine are. I try to condense them down on each one, but you guys know that you can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Go to hollyrandallandfilter.com to learn more about this podcast and sign up for our monthly newsletter. And of course, as always, to support the show, go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallandfiltered. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.